Hi, everybody. My name is David Gully. This is the first of a two-part series on the labor market. Um, please check out our YouTube channel, Bentley University EC391, for some really cool videos on monetary policy and the macro economy. So our agenda today, we're going to take a look at a number of labor market indicators. Then we'll take a look at supply and demand side factors that are currently impacting uh, the labor market. Uh, we'll take then look, uh, a deep dive in uh, various measures of wages. Uh, and then in part two, uh, we'll take a look at current labor market issues, including the great resignation, job matching, and a number of other factors. And so since the pandemic, there have been some very, very major changes uh, in the labor market. It's very difficult to know, even at this point, whether or not these changes are permanent or not so permanent. Even still, there are going to be very probably very important implications for monetary policy and long-run economic growth. And so let's take first a look at three standard measures of the labor market, the U3 unemployment rate, the number of people employed, and the level of weekly jobless claims. So here's the U3 unemployment rate. This is the unemployment rate that gets the most attention uh, every month. It's released uh, on the first Friday of the following month, and it's defined as the number of people unemployed. To be counted as unemployed, you have to first obviously not have a job, but you also have had to look uh, at least once in the last four weeks uh, for work. And that's divided by the number of people who are unemployed plus the number of people who are employed. So the denominator is the civilian labor force. And the numerator is the, the, uh, the number of unemployed. Do the simple division, you get the unemployment rate. And so you can see going back here, unemployment peaked out at 10% post Great Recession. You can see the slow downward trend here. So just before the pandemic, the unemployment rate reached in February 2020, 3.5%. Then in March uh, and April, it skyrocketed up to a maximum of 14.7%. And we've seen a very, very fast downward decline in the unemployment rate, very thankfully, of course. And you can see here that now post-pandemic, here we are in late 2022, that the unemployment rate has reached its pre-pandemic lows. And so by this metric, it looks like the labor market uh, has healed. But there's more to the story. So here's the level of employment. This is a number of non-farm uh, payroll employees measured by the government. So not surprisingly, again, here's the Great Recession. You can see employment declined. It slowly climbed back and then, oops, technical difficulty, sorry about that. Climbed back and peaked out again here in February 2020. You can see the sharp decline uh, right at the beginning of the pandemic and then the relatively sharp rebound. And of course, you can see that we've peaked now above the previous uh, February 2020 peak in terms of the level of employment. And so this would look like to say, oh gosh, the labor market's healed. But if you just extrapolated a very simple trend from pre-pandemic, we'd be still short around 3 million jobs plus or minus. Uh, again, the estimate's a little bit hard, and again, this is just a rough, uh, a rough uh, extrapolation of the trend. But the point is, there are a number of labor market dynamics that have shifted, and we're going to talk about these in this video and the subsequent video. Uh, and then finally, again, this, these are just rough indicators here, uh, weekly jobless claims. Uh, one of the issues in terms of the uh, unemployment rate and the level of payroll employment is there's a little bit of lag in those. They're released monthly, and they're only released the following month. Um, and so it's a slight looking backward. Weekly jobless claims look back only effectively one week. They're released every Thursday morning uh, with only one week lag. So they give the closest thing we have to a real-time indicator of what's happening in the labor market. So uh, individual states collect data on the number of people who have filed uh, unemployment claims after they've been, for example, laid off or they've been been fired otherwise. Uh, there are limits in terms of who can collect, but the idea is that this gives a rough and quick indicator of how things are going. And so you can see here in this chart, these are uh, jobless claims pre-pandemic from the late 60s until, again, just before the pandemic. You can see the big surprise, they increased during recessions, the recessions, of course, are the gray bars, and then they decline during expansions. And you can see here by just before the the pandemic, weekly jobs claims were hanging around just over 200,000 uh, per week for the most part. And you can see that hadn't been that low since the 1960s. And what's important here is that the um, 
uh, number of un unemployment claims is not adjusted for the size of the labor force. So the size of labor force is increased dramatically. And so what this indicates that compared to, for example, the late 60s, even though the level of claims is about the same, a portion of the size of the labor force, they're much smaller. So now here we have the pandemic. And you know, of course, the uh, pandemic unemployment claims uh, skyrocketed and so dwarf out uh, the previous levels of claims. So they're you know, just a, back here, practically a flat line, hardly any variation at all. And so here's the you know, April, uh, March and April uh, data. And you can see they've declined pretty notably. And here we are again in very late 2022. And by this measure, again, unemployment claims have reached you know, very, very low levels. And so if you just eyeball these, it looks like the labor market has you know, more or less recovered you know, its pandemic losses here. But as we'll see, there's, there's tons more going on in the background. And the idea is that people just didn't all go back to their old jobs. And so what we wanna do here is look at some supply side factors and some demand side factors to try to get an idea of what's happening with the labor market. And what we wanna always keep in mind, and I'll make this point a couple of times as we go along here, it's easy to talk about these in, in conceptually, supply versus demand factors, but sometimes it's, it's not so easy with the data to sort out, well, is a supply side factor that's working or demand side factor that's working? So let's take a look at a couple of ways to summarize uh, what's happening in the labor market with uh, various indicators. And so this is from uh, the Atlanta Fed and they put together what's called a spider graph. And so you can see it looks kind of a spider web, so hence the name. And what it does is it tries to look at simultaneously a number of variables to try to give a collective look at, well, what's the state of the labor market? And so you can see arrayed around the wheel here, there's the initial claims data that we just talked about, there's the payroll employment data we just talked about, there's the unemployment rate that we just talked about, and a number of others. All of these measures can give an indication of the relative strength of the labor force by, for example, looking at wage growth, looking at whether employers are hiring or not, looking at how confident people are in terms of the availability, you know, right here, the availability of jobs from surveys. So there's all kinds of measures here, all kinds of metrics trying to get a picture of the labor market. And so the, the one problem is that you face when talking about the labor market is that the data are measured in many different ways. So for example, payroll employment, you have, you know, that's measured in the millions and changes in hundreds of thousands per month. The, for example, um, the job finding rate right here, this is measured in a percent. So there's a number of different metrics here that are different scales. And so what this indicator does, this, this uh, spider graph does, is it uh, collapses all of these uh, into a common denominator, effectively an index value that's measured relative to a peak or a trough. And the closer you are to the edge of the wheel, the better it is, the closer you are to the center, the worse. And so let's take a look at the unemployment rate. So right here, here's the unemployment rate. And so you can see that from you know, the, um, the chart up here, the key up here, November, 2022 versus February, 2020. So the idea is that February, 2020 was kind of the previous peak of the labor market as we indicated earlier. And we want to see, well, how does the current labor market as of November fit in with what it was just pre-pandemic? And so you can see here the uh, blue line, the solid blue line, that's right here, pre-pandemic. And the orange line, that's where we are again right now in no, as of November. And again, closer to the edge of the circle, the better. And so you can see that by most measures, the uh, labor market is at least as good as it was pre-pandemic and in some instances, for example, especially with respect to wages, substantially better. And at its worst, right here, here's April, 2020, that's, that's the green line right here. And so other than wage indicators, what this shows is that the labor market collapsed. And so this is a sort of quick and dirty way to see how a number of indicators uh, show what the labor market looks like. You can also try to collapse uh, indicators into a single variable. So this is the Kansas City Fed Labor Market Condition Index. So they take 24 different variables, uh, the ones on the previous chart and some others, 
and they collapse them into a single value. And this is scaled at zero. Oops. This is scaled at zero for its long run average. So if it's above zero, above long run average, below zero, below its long run average. So you can see here with the blue line, this is the level indicator. Things deteriorated during the Great uh, Recession. And then of course they deteriorated during the pandemic. But if you look at the level indicator, the pandemic, the blue line again, doesn't look as terrible as the Great Recession because the decline wasn't any greater and the bounce back, as you can see here again, the blue line was substantially faster. But if you look at the solid red line, this is an indicator of momentum. So this is, you know, remember a physics concept. So momentum is mass times velocity and you know, velocity has a direction. So it's kind of like a vector. And so the momentum indicator gives an indication of the speed, or in other words, the ferocity of the change in the labor market indicators from uh, the pandemic. And you can see that the mo momentum in the pandemic was substantially far higher, or you know, in this case, far below average, relative to the Great Recession. It also bounced back much quick, more quickly. And so you can see that the while the level is re still relatively solid, it's weakened just a little bit here in late 2022. And as a consequence, notice the momentum has slowed very dramatically. It's almost back toward its long run average. So let's take now a look at supply side factors. And so initially at the very beginning of the pandemic, demand for labor fell catastrophically. You know, the economy shut down. And so businesses laid off workers left and right. And so big surprise, as we've seen earlier, employment fell very, very sharply. However, agri demand for a variety of reasons that we'll talk about, bounced back exceptionally rapidly. So the demand for workers increased enormously. However, despite that, it still looks like various labor supply indicators are still not recovered. And there's probably a whole bunch of reasons for these, and we'll go through these you know, one at a time. Retirements, uh, fear of COVID, long COVID, um, childcare challenges, uh, and sort of a reevaluation of one's life priorities. So let's start with a basic measure of labor supply. This is the labor force participation rate. And so this is the number of people uh, who are employed plus the number of people who are unemployed divided by the civilian labor force. And so what we wanna talk about here is that, you know, pre-pandemic, there was kind of a general downward trend like so, stabilized around 63% of the civilian non-institutional population. Very beginning of the pandemic, a sharp downward trend, a move of about three percentage points. And then roughly speaking, post-pandemic, we've recovered about half of that, but notice in about the last you know, eight or nine months or so, it's, it's stabilized out. We haven't seen a big bounce back in the participation rate despite a super strong labor market. So what I can do is I can break this down by uh, age groups. And so what I've done here is I've looked at people aged 25 to 54, these are called prime age workers. Roughly speaking, these are people who are for the most part done with school and are, who are too young to retire. And so it's most likely that this age group is going to be in the labor force uh, and not out of the labor force. And so you can see the red line here, that's the, that's the overall figure for everybody and then broken down by men. So the male participation rate is somewhat higher than that for women. But notice the participation rate of women has now finally bounced back to its pre-pandemic level, but that the participation rate of prime age men still yet has not. And by the way, this is concentrated mostly in uh, younger men and men uh, with high school or less or, or lower educational attainment. So let's now take a look at these supply side factors in some details. We'll go through these one at a time. So first, childcare disruptions. And so the government, um, the Bureau of Labor Statistics in particular, uh, tried to gather some data on looking at how households were impacted by availability of childcare. And so for example, a survey taken, you know, mid 2021, you know, effectively they asked, you know, gosh, uh, how, you know, what percent of, of the uh, survey respondents indicated problems with attaining childcare in terms of availability and, and so forth. 
And so if it's a, a state is colored in blue, that means there was there are disruptions. And the darker the blue, the larger the fraction of the population reported disruptions. And so not having uh, child care availability uh, impacts uh, households' decisions to supply work in terms of who works and how much they work. Health issues uh, have been pretty substantial. Uh, this is from uh, a recent study looking at uh, how people move from being employed to being out of the labor force due to a health-related issue. And so what they looked at here, so an HRA, that's a health-related uh, absence to NILF, that's not in the labor force, pre versus post-COVID. And generally, if a worker has a health-related absence, it's almost always short-term. And so pre-pandemic, relatively few workers who were had a health-related absence were out of the labor force a month later. However, post-pandemic, so here's the pandemic right there. Post-pandemic, a substantially larger number of people were out of the labor force a month later after reporting a health-related absence. 12 months later, same thing. Post-pandemic, the idea is that more people have moved out of the labor force after experiencing health-related absences. And, and the suggestion is that this is perhaps due to COVID, and this adds up to the hundreds of thousands or perhaps in the low millions of people, depending on the particular estimates. But the idea is this has a material impact on the supply of labor. Here's another angle on this. Uh, this is from a recent uh, Brookings paper. Uh, article trying to estimate aggregate lost wages due to long COVID. And so there have been, a, been many, many attempts to gauge how many people have uh, left the labor force, or at least out of the labor force, thanks to long COVID, uh, and then what's the economic impact of this. And so these there are a number of estimates. And so on the low end, this is from the Federal Reserve. So roughly speaking, not quite 2 million people out of the labor force. Uh, these data are based on uh, some uh, information from the UK then applied to the US labor market. So this suggests perhaps not quite 3 million people are out of the labor force. And then using data from a Lancet study, again, um, applied to the US, around 4 million people. And of course, then there's the higher commensurate lost wages. So the point here is that, yes, the estimates vary quite a bit, but the impact is probably pretty substantial. Part of the reason that the aggregate supply of labor has decreased somewhat is because older workers have left their jobs. So this is from a recent study trying to figure out, well, how many people would have retired anyways versus how many people actually retired thanks to, for example, being afraid of COVID or long COVID or just simply not wanting to, to work anymore. And so what they did is they tried to look at excess retirements relative to what would be predicted, in other words, expected retirements. And so you can see here the, the solid black line. This is not participation for all people age 16 or older. And then focusing on right here, people retiring out of the labor force, older workers. And so in the purple area, that's the expected change in retirement. And then the total area, that's the actual change. And so this is the right here, this is the excess. And so the idea is that from uh, the earliest parts of the pandemic through uh, later in 2022, many uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of older workers have left the labor force and may not return. Even younger workers have been impacted. So this is the size of the workforce age 20 to 24, pre-recession, or excuse me, pre-pandemic, post-pandemic. And certainly it's bounced back, but not quite to the level that it was. And the aggregate number of people um, you know, in that age group has, has you know, increased a little bit. And so even absent that trend, or even with that trend, the level of uh, employment uh, or the workforce participation simply has not bounced back. Another impact is aside from you know, this decline in the labor force participation rate is the decline in the number of hours worked. 
And so this is a, a recent study from uh, Faberman and some other authors here in 2022. And so you can see the orange line right here. This is the labor force participation rate change. This is the same version, the same visual we had up earlier. But they've also looked at hours worked uh, per week. And that's the solid blue line. And so notice that hours worked per week cratered at the beginning of the pandemic, but have not come anywhere close to bouncing back. And the reason that's important is because sometimes with the hours worked data, it's difficult to know whether that's because of a change in demand for labor or a change in supply. So remember earlier I mentioned it's hard sometimes to talk about, you know, knowing whether it's a supply factor or demand factor. Here we can be pretty sure it's a supply factor. Here's why. So at the very beginning of the pandemic, you see the large decline in hours worked. That could certainly be explained by the decline in demand for labor. Not only were fewer people working, there was lower demand for the labor of even people still remaining to work. So their hours worked per week declined. However, since then, there's been a gigantic demand or increase in demand for labor. There has not been a commensurate increase in the hours worked as a result. As we'll you know, see in a minute here, wages have risen substantially too. So the idea that this is caused by this decline in hours worked is caused by the demand decline is not very plausible. And so this could be people reevaluating their priorities and on the net declining to work overtime, extended hours, and so forth. So let's have a look at some demand side factors here. Uh, labor demand is what's known as derived demand. The idea here is that uh, companies don't hire workers for their own sake. They hire workers based on the demand for the final product and services that a particular company produces. And so as we mentioned at the beginning of the pandemic, there's a precipitous decline in labor demand and it was exceptionally rapid. But thanks to various factors, monetary policy changes, fiscal policy changes, and the reopening of the economy, huge increase in labor demand that occurred especially quickly. And again, this is compared to previous recessions. But as we mentioned earlier, this doesn't mean that everybody went back to their previous jobs. So let's take a look at job openings and hirings. And so you can see here, this is the solid red line. These are job openings. And as you can see, big surprise, beginning of the pandemic, they declined precipitously. But notice the incredible boom post-pandemic in terms of job openings. So firms trying to hire workers were having some difficulty, of course, in terms of actually being able to hire those folks, despite the fact that a big, at the beginning of the pandemic, so the dotted red line, that's hires, that spiked, but then did not increase commensurately with the openings. And you can see here, in the last four or five months that hirings have slowed a little bit and job openings have declined somewhat. So this is an indication that the labor market is starting to soften a little bit. Broken down by industry, we can see variations in the uh, uh, particular industries here. So the, uh, the, make sure I get this correct here. So the pink line, this is the total openings rate. That's the same chart we had up earlier effectively. Then in terms of looking at several industries, this is healthcare and social assistance, assisted living facilities, nursing homes, you know, home health care aides, things like this. A lot of openings there. And then also finance and insurance, in other words, uh, you know, banks, insurance companies, pension funds, and so forth. Openings haven't quite kept up there. And notice that in the last few months here, openings in those industries or those types of firms have declined fairly precipitously. So let's take a look at wages now. Uh, wages, of course, big surprise, a function of labor supply and labor demand. And one of the questions that uh, Jerome Powell and the Fed have been asking, is there a wage price spiral? And his suggestion is that, well, no, there's not. But even despite that, there is some evidence that expected inflation is affecting uh, or correlated with at least nominal wage growth. So Jorda and some other authors just recently did an analysis and tried to decompose nominal wage growth. So that's the, so nominal wage growth would be the height of the, of each bar here, pre versus post pandemic, and break it down into various or correlate it with various factors right here. So the one we care about is 
the red, you know, the red bar here, and notice that pre-pandemic, that nominal wage growth was not very well explained, or not very much of nominal wage growth was explained by expected inflation measures that we've covered in another series of videos. But post-pandemic notice is that a substantial fraction of wage growth, nominal wage growth, is correlated with expected inflation. And so what this indicates perhaps is that pre-pandemic, workers and companies weren't paying all that much attention because inflation was relatively low. But post-pandemic, now that inflation is substantially higher, workers and companies are paying much more attention. The Atlanta Fed provides some really, really helpful data here in terms of looking at wage growth broken down by uh, different metrics. And so what I've done here is look at overall wage growth. This is the purple line. So this is just nominal wage growth um, for all employees. And two different categories here, people who stay in their jobs, that's the yellow line, in other words, folks who get raises, versus people who change their jobs, go to another company, for example, what kind of raises do they get? Well, job switchers have gotten substantially larger wage growth relative to job stayers. So this is part perhaps of the great resignation, so to speak, people have been changing jobs, partly at least because they've been able to, thanks to very high labor demand, been able to uh, commandeer relatively high wages, so good for them. In terms of where the wage growth is coming from, you can break uh, income down into quartiles, the lowest 25, the next 25%, the next 25%, and then the highest 25%. And so that's what I've done right here. So I've got these four lines. These are the various quartiles. And so the red solid line, those are the people in the highest 25% of the income distribution. The light blue line here, those are the folks in the lowest 25% uh, of the income distribution. So people in the lowest income brackets have seen the highest percentage wage growth by far relative to higher income workers. And so this is generally service workers, for example, uh, being in very high demand. By age, notice here, the light blue line, that's the youngest people, age 16 to 24, younger workers, entry-level workers have seen by far the highest wage growth. And then if you look here, people age 55 and over, they've seen, relatively speaking, <coughs> excuse me, the lowest wage growth. And so one question arises, if you've got relatively strong wage growth, is this bringing people back into the labor force? You know, the idea is that, you know, in any principles of economics class, you learn that labor supply curves slope upward, other things equal, increase in wages, the quantity of labor supply ought to rise. So in a really interesting study, Hotchkiss uh, looked at uh, labor supply elasticity across different generations. And what he found is that it, they're smaller for younger workers. And so the idea is perhaps that nominal wage growth might not do that great of a job in terms of bringing people back into the labor force. And so here's the visual, and this is the wage elasticity for uh, baby boomers, relatively older folks. These are folks born between 1946 and 19. 64. And comparatively speaking, Generation X, the next generation and millennials, the generation following them, they have relatively lower wage, or, uh, wage elasticities in terms of labor supply. And so the point is that wage growth isn't sufficient to bring relatively younger workers necessarily back into the labor force. Now, let's look at real wages. So, you know, I've been talking about nominal wages. Well, in 2020 and 2021, before inflation increased relatively dramatically, real wage growth was very substantial. And so here in 2020 and 2021 indicates that even controlling for inflation, wage growth was positive. However, here in 2022, for most workers, real wages have turned, or growth has turned negative thanks to the relatively high inflation. So despite uh, strong nominal gains, they've not yet been able to outpace inflation, at least in the first part of 2022. So to summarize here, um, by most measures, the labor market is still uh, pretty tight. It is, as we've noted, softened somewhat 
Um, how much is yet to be seen, hopefully not too much, uh, as long as especially we can bring the relatively high rate of inflation down. Uh, the Fed has stated repeatedly that what they want to do is reduce labor demand, but they don't want to reduce it so much as to really have a large effect on the level of employment. And this is a super hard thing to do. This is what is generally referred to as a soft landing. Can you bring down inflation without doing too much damage to the labor market? It's a, it's a very, very hard thing to accomplish. What we'll look at in the next video is there's a number of factors long term that are still impacting the labor market that haven't fully worked themselves out. So for example, how much will work from home uh, stay and how much will it be reversed? There's all kinds of changes as we've already hinted at uh, the labor supply situation. The composition of labor demand has changed. And so all these factors going forward will impact the labor market. And this is what we'll take a look at in part two. All right, thank you all very much.